He is a preeminent voice in sports media, sports writing, The Athletic. It is Stuart Mandel, editor-in-chief with The Athletic in their college football division. He also has a podcast called The Audible. I encourage everybody to check out and subscribe to that. I'm Brian Fendley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. And Stuart, thanks again for your time. You have a gazillion things going on right now, but really would enjoy just a couple moments to to shine some light on your career and what you've been able to accomplish so let's start here you know athletes as as those and you understand the psyche of athletes covering them doing stories on them doing features throughout your career and and a lot of the most successful ones enjoy that feeling that they create within themselves where they want to feel underestimated like as a sense of this is my way of motivating myself when in your career, on the come up to where you are now, did you feel like you were under, underestimated and how you use that as fuel for seeing your dreams through? Um, you know, early on, uh, like, you know, to date myself here a little bit, but like coming out of college in the late 90s, um, there was just this kind of, we were, we were in the very early phases or stages of transitioning from kind of the old newspaper driven model to more digital. And, you know, I think that I saw, you know, by the end of college or right after college, where things were going with the internet and that that was the future, but most people in my profession didn't see it that way. And so, I mean, I was fortunate to get a job at what was then CNNSI, uh, their website at 23. I think if, you know, if not for that, for that, the advent of those sites, I wouldn't have been covering national college football so young. Um, but it was a struggle to be taken seriously because, you know, the many of the schools, many of the people that ran the media operations at these schools or other writers out there, like, what is this? Th- what is this internet thing? Like, <laughs> you just, you didn't have the legitimacy that those, that certainly those outlets have come to have pretty shortly thereafter. So those first few years, um, it wasn't that anybody was like criticizing my work or not taking me for it's just that we were seen as I can't even describe it to people who who are younger but like we were just the dot-com guys like there was a stigma attached to being with a dot-com it wasn't a newspaper it wasn't a magazine what's the longest amount of time you've spent on a feature um you know there have been a there were a few certainly at Sports Illustrated magazine features that just that process can be pretty involved um, where, I mean, you might start reporting a story in May that doesn't end up running till August. That's not generally most of what I do, columns, mailbags, like those are more, frankly, most of the stuff I write goes up the next day after it was written. Sure. But, you know, some of those longer length stories, um, I'm thinking of one in particular about when Urban Meyer first got to Florida and this new revolutionary offense he was running, the spread option. Mm-hmm. I mean, I went down in the spring, spring football to interview him for it and learn more about it. And then and that was for the preview magazine that came out in August. And there was a lot of like, then when I was back in New York, making a lot of phone calls to other coaches who were considered pioneers in that. So um, that one may be the longest now that I think about it. What about the most emotionally draining because it was around a sensitive issue. Maybe you had to cover a tragedy where it even triggered something within you where it was just, it was really hard to write in something that affects you or even impacts you to this day. Well, everything about the Jerry Sandusky scandal at Penn State when it first broke was t- was really challenging and really tough because it was such, you know, the horrific details of what he did. Um, made it so that every everybody that was consuming that story was so you had you had all the people who are who were outraged and and were kind of like uh, ext- had extreme emotions in that direction and then Penn State fans as you know a lot of Penn State fans were so emotion angry and emotional over the vilific what they felt was a vilification yeah. of Joe Paterno and there was no middle ground and I'm somebody who operates in the middle ground like let's explore all sides of this issue. But for, there were a lot of people that felt there were no two sides to it. Um, There were, like there were two sides, 
but nobody was willing to look at the whole picture. And so I was writing things, especially early on that were, I wouldn't even say they were sympathetic to Joe Paterno. They just weren't crucifying him and took a lot of, frankly, some of those criticism I ever taken in my career for some of those stories. So that was really hard. We're talking with Stuart Mandel of The Athletic. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at FSR. So you take the middle ground there. When has there been an issue where you've taken the harshest stance? And perhaps it was something that you don't do very often, but you felt a certain feeling about a certain issue and you made a statement. I mean, I held pretty firm on the Urban Meyer stuff um, with Zach Smith. I never sure. called for him to be fired and I never accused him of covering up uh, domestic abuse, but I felt as the facts of that story were emerging right from the very beginning, right? That first big 10 media days, which I was at, um, that he had clearly made some really, really bad decisions. And of course, that's one of those stories where the fan base of the, of the coach of this highly successful coach is, I mean, rallying around him and, uh, some of the comment sections on some of those stories were pretty tough. Um, But I've known him for so long and, and um, it just didn't take long into that to realize what had happened. Like that he had just had this total blind spot to his mentor's grandson and let him stay on the staff way past when he should have. And um, so I stood pretty firm. And I think the report that came out, you know, at the end validated that. Um, but you know, you had to put up with a lot of backlash and a lot of Ohio state. I mean, I thought the most unfortunate part was that in, I understood why they were defending urban Meyer, their national championship coach, but why they were defending this serial accused domestic abuser on his staff to like make that point was really troubling. You were heavily involved in that case and that story. And you certainly have broken a lot of stories over the years. And there's such a, I would think, a competition to be the first to, to get that story. What is it like as far as the, the mosh pit that you and your contemporaries that are at the top of the game of college football reporting, sports media in general, have to deal with to, to, to be the first and to make sure you're the one that gets it first and how you deal with that? Well, my colleague, Bruce Feldman, does that a lot more than I do. And he, <laughs> my co-host, he he breaks all the coaching news and, and I've kind of vicariously lived through some of that, like where he's been, you know, like we were at a national championship game and he was, he had this coaching scoop, but he couldn't officially report it yet. And he had, and then we went to the beach or something for an event and then somebody else broke it. You know, that can be really demoralizing, but you know, I think that the, the times that I've had like really big scoops, like, um, during big 12 expansion uh, or almost expansion in 2016. Um, I caught wind that, a, that are some um, LGBT advocacy groups were preparing to send a letter to the big 12 um, about BYU, about BYU and their policies. And that, you know, they were, they were going to protest if they invited them. And I, and I was pretty sure I had it to myself, but you just, you never know. And sure. that took, time to vet and to put together and you just the whole time you're just holding your breath like because it's just the worst feeling in the world if then somebody else comes out with it in the meantime the very first feature you did on an athlete going back to grade school who (laughs) was it um i think i mean i assume it was for my high school paper but i couldn't tell you what athlete it was now i do remember um, we're going way back here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was in high school in Cincinnati in, and I graduated in 1994. And, um, the summer before my senior year, I got, I freelanced for a, it was a citywide publication about high school sports. And, um, sorry. Oh, you're good. Um, you're good. They asked me, so there were two McDonald's All-Americans in Cincinnati that year, which was not something like, that's not a place that necessarily always produces um, high level basketball recruits. So I remember they assigned me to do a story on one of those guys who ended up going to Iowa. And I just, I just remember, you know, in my mind, like I'm 16, 17 years old, this guy's a huge star. And, and, and yet, you know, in 1993, you could just go in the phone book and find his parents' number and call him up. <laughs> and 
And, and I just remember thinking that that was so cool. Like, I can't believe I just called his name was Chris Kingsbury. I can't believe I just called Chris Kingsbury. Um, you don't think that would work now, but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, probably not. Yeah, I don't think uh, there's no magic book that has athletes' cell phone numbers, but yeah. Final question for you, Stuart, and thanks again so much for your time. How harsh are you on your own work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I've heard, you know, I, I don't think I'm in my head as much as some people are, like just on our staff alone. We have a lot mm -hmm. of people who really beat themselves up if they feel like it wasn't quite up to what they wanted or somebody beat them to a certain story. Um, but I'm also not just like sending it in and never thinking about it again. I'm somewhere in between. Um, you know, the good thing about writing for a digital site, like I remember at Sports Illustrated, it was considered so much more prestigious to write for the magazine, like to get a story in the magazine, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so obviously I wanted to do that, but it was always so weird because you'd write it and then you not, it was like, you know, supposedly that magazine goes out to 2.5 million people, but you don't hear from any of them. Like there's no instant feedback. Whereas with this, with digital, you know, you put something out into the world and you're immediately getting comment section, Twitter, maybe emails. So, you know, pretty well, pretty quickly how well it was received. And it's always disappointing if you worked hard on something and put it out there and it gets no response. Um, but I don't lose sleep over it, fortunately. The, the perfect frame of mind, so talented and so good at what you do. Stuart Mandel, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. I'm Brian Fenley.